Good morning, and welcome to the Hormel Foods First Quarter 2023 Earnings Conference Call. All participants will be in a listen-only mode. After today's presentation, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, please press the star, then the number two. Thank you. Please note, this event is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to David Dahlstrom, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Good morning. Welcome to the Hormel Foods Conference Call for the first quarter of fiscal 2023. We released our results this morning before the market opened, around 6.30 a.m. Eastern. If you did not receive a copy of the release, you can find it on our website at hormelfoods.com under the Investors section. On our call today is Jim Snee, Chairman of the Board, President and Chief Executive Officer, Jacinth Smiley, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and Deanna Brady, Executive Vice President of the Retail Segment. Jim will review the company's first quarter results and give a perspective on the rest of fiscal 2023. Jacinth will provide detailed financial results and further commentary on our outlook, and Deanna will join for the Q&A portion of the call. The line will be open for questions following Jacinth's remarks. As a courtesy to the other analysts, please limit yourself to one question with one follow-up. If you have additional questions, you are welcome to get back into the queue. At the conclusion of this morning's call, a webcast replay will be posted to our investor website and archived for one year. Additionally, earlier this week, we filed a Form 8K with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission that included supplemental segment financial information for fiscal years 2021 and 2022 related to the Go Forward initiative. We have posted a copy of the Form 8K to our investor website, investor.hormelfoods.com. Before we get started, I need to reference the safe harbor statement. Some of the comments made today will be forward-looking, and actual results may differ materially from those expressed in or implied by the statements we will be making. Please refer to our most recent annual report on Form 10-K and quarterly reports on Form 10-Q, which can be accessed at hormelfoods.com under the investor section. I will now turn the call over to Jim Snee. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. With the release of our recast financial information earlier this week, our transition from a structural and reporting perspective is now complete for the Go Forward initiative. I want to take time to acknowledge the immense amount of work the entire team has put in to transition the business to our new strategic operating model. We have spent time discussing the strategic rationale and how our actions over the past decade have positioned us for go forward. But there has been a lot of blocking and tackling that had to take place first to get us to where we are today. Over the past six months, we stood up three new business segments and consolidated the Genio Turkey Store segment. This included organizing the retail segment into six distinct verticals and combining the food service businesses across the enterprise. We invested in new centers of excellence, including Brand Fuel and a dedicated FP&A team. And we made changes to the administrative side of the business to recast the financial statements, align and structure our entities and duties, maintain controls across the business, and, of course, operate our business without interruption. We have learned a lot about our people, processes, and technology going through this transition. While we have work to do in all of these areas, I am encouraged by the conversations that are taking place across the organization. The operating environment remains challenging, and while many areas of the business performed ahead of last year during the first quarter, our results were disappointing and below our expectations. From a top-line perspective, demand from consumers and operators generally remained elevated in key categories, and we delivered balanced growth between volume and price across many parts of our portfolio. We continued to see elevated demand for many of our center store, refrigerated, Mexican, and premium items at retail, including Black Label Bacon, Columbus Charcuterie, Hormel chili, Hormel pepperoni, 
Applegate breaded chicken, Herdez products, square table entrees, and Mary Kitchen hash. Likewise, solutions-based items in our food service segment had another strong quarter. With volume growth in sliced meats and from brands such as Cafe H, Fire Braze, Bacon One, and Austin Blues. For the quarter, sales declined 2%. As a reminder, there continues to be volatility in our overall volume and net sales results given the planned volume declines in commodity pork and the volume impacts across the turkey supply chain due to highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI. Diluted net earnings per share for the quarter was $0.40, cents, a $0.04 cent decline compared to last year. Our results reflect the persistent impact from inflationary pressures, supply chain inefficiencies, and lower sales volumes across each of the business segments. Now turning to our segments, results in the retail segment declined compared to last year. Net sales growth from the bacon, global flavors, convenient meals and proteins, and emerging brands verticals was offset by lower sales in the value-added meats and snacking and entertaining verticals. Segment profit declined as the benefit from pricing actions across the portfolio, higher equity and earnings from Megamex, and improved results for the bacon business were more than offset by the impact from lower net sales, unfavorable mix, and higher operating costs. The bacon vertical delivered outstanding results in the quarter due to elevated demand for our black label items. There was also a benefit from commodity relief in pork bellies throughout the quarter as we work through higher cost inventory. This is a category where we have made significant investments and one we expect to show growth for the year. Similarly, the Global Flavors vertical, made up of our Megamix business, had an excellent start to the year. The pricing actions that we have taken across this business to combat inflationary pressures, coupled with commodity relief on avocado inputs, led to revenue and equity and earnings gains for the quarter. The emerging brands vertical delivered volume and sales growth for the Applegate brand, led by frozen breaded chicken and wall deli items. The convenient meals and proteins vertical achieved another quarter of net sales growth led by Hormel Chili, Square Table Refrigerated Entrees, and Mary Kitchen Hash, in addition to a benefit from pricing actions we implemented last year. We will have new capacity for spam items beginning in the second quarter. In addition to supporting our highest selling products in the category, this new capacity allows us to restore assortments, introduce new flavors such as maple, and relaunch our seven ounce spam item after a three year hiatus. This provides excellent value for consumers seeking a more affordable option in the category. Skippy peanut butter sales for the quarter were significantly behind last year. Last May, when we made the decision to relentlessly support our customers and the peanut butter category, we knew it would pressure inventory levels and have lingering impacts into fiscal 2023. This was the right decision for all stakeholders, and our team deserves credit for growing the peanut butter category and making the product readily available for our customers and consumers when they needed it. Demand remains robust for the Skippy brand and the category and we are working diligently to maximize capacity and return inventories and fill rates to normalized levels. Net sales declined for the snacking and entertaining vertical as growth for the Columbus and Hormel pepperoni brands was more than offset by a year over year decline in the snack nuts business. The final vertical, 
value-added meats was most heavily impacted by lower commodity pork and turkey availability, leading to net sales declines. In the food service segment, products in the sliced meats, pepperoni, premium prepared proteins, and premium bacon and breakfast sausage categories grew volume and net sales for the quarter. Like retail, the overall decline in volume was driven primarily by limited turkey and fresh pork availability. Segment profit increased for the quarter due to improved mix across the portfolio. Results for the segment were below our expectations, reflecting industry softness from mid-December into January. However, we have seen a sharp rebound in orders to begin the second quarter and are confident in our ability to grow the business this year. Finally, the international segment was heavily impacted by external factors during the first quarter. From a top-line perspective, our branded export business had a strong quarter led by the Spam and Skippy brands. We also saw another quarter of improved results in Brazil as the team continues to focus on its premium products and food service strategy. Commodity turkey volumes declined almost 80% compared to last year due to restrictions on turkey exports and limited supply as we strategically diverted raw material to support the domestic business. Our team in China faced incredibly difficult operating conditions throughout the quarter as the impact of COVID-related policy changes had dramatic short-term effects on the business as well as our employees, customers, and operators. Taken together, the impact from lower turkey exports and disruption in China represented a more than one cent earnings per share impact on the quarter compared to last year. We are seeing improvement in China to begin the second quarter, especially in our food service business. As conditions normalize, we expect our China business to resume delivering accelerated growth. During the quarter, we purchased a minority stake in Garuda Food, one of the largest food and beverage companies in Indonesia. This investment supports our international growth ambitions and the global execution of our snacking and entertaining strategy. Garuda Food is a market leader with strong and reputable brands, local expertise, and a best-in-class distribution network. We have been partnering with the Garuda Food team for several years, and this strategic investment enhances that partnership. Jacinth will provide the financial details of the transaction later in the call. As we disclosed earlier this morning, we are reaffirming our top-line expectations and reducing our diluted net earnings per share outlook for fiscal 2023. Our top line remains healthy, and despite softness in the first quarter, we are on track to deliver growth for the year. Demand for our leading center store and refrigerated retail brands remains favorable. The food service segment expects strong growth for the remainder of the year, and we anticipate the near-term challenges impacting the international segment to abate over the coming months. Compared to our expectations heading into the year, earnings are being pressured by inefficiencies across the supply chain, persistent inflationary pressures, and softness in the snack nuts category. I want to detail how we plan to address each of these challenges for the balance of the year. First, I would like to discuss the state of our supply chain. It is important to note that we have made progress over the last year staffing our facilities, expanding production capacity, and improving fill rates for each of our businesses. This has allowed us to catch up to demand in most categories and further supports the confidence we have in our revenue outlook for this year and longer term. Since the fall, we have been operating with elevated inventories due to our efforts to increase production, optimize plant performance, 
and return fill rates to historical levels. We expected this inventory to clear during the normal course of business. This has not happened, and in fact, we have seen inventories continue to grow in a number of areas. This has resulted in inefficiencies across the supply chain and higher operating costs. We are taking immediate action to combat these inefficiencies by focusing on selling excess inventories and reducing the reliance on third-party warehouses and co-packers. These actions are expected to cause short-term margin compression, but they are necessary as we look to restore profitability to normalize levels and reduce complexity. Simply said, after almost three years of chasing unprecedented demand, our ability to supply our customers, consumers, and operators caught up to, and in some cases began to exceed demand, and we needed to react sooner. Rectifying the inefficiencies caused by elevated inventory levels is the top priority in the company. Second, we continue to operate in a volatile, complex, and high-cost environment and cost pressures remain high. Our retail businesses, especially in the center store, continue to be disproportionately impacted by high inflationary pressures. And the pricing actions we have taken over the last 18 months still lag inflation. To help mitigate some of this pressure, we have announced additional inflationary justified pricing actions in certain retail categories effective late in the second quarter. We are evaluating further pricing actions, but as we've said, our teams remain highly focused on the long-term needs of the business and protecting the equity of our brand. For the remainder of the year, we believe we can stabilize these margin pressures through a combination of pricing actions, operational cost management, and supply chain cost savings initiatives. Third, after meeting expectations last year, our planters business is off to a slower than expected start in 2023. There are numerous factors at play, including general category softness, a consumer shift away from certain higher priced items, production challenges, and timing issues. We are taking immediate action to address the current challenges, stabilize the top line, and grow the consumer base. Beginning in the second quarter, we are shifting resources to drive consumption. This includes increasing promotional support and prioritizing peanut items and pack sizes aimed at value-seeking consumers. We are bringing much-needed innovation to the category with flavored cashews and several new corn nuts flavors. We're expanding assortments as we continue to gain distribution for the brand. And we are investing in capital for higher growth items that are relevant for today's consumer. Long term, we remain fully committed to the planters brand and the snack nuts category. This business is at the center of our snacking and entertaining strategy, our ambitions to grow in the convenience store channel, and as we look to become even more balanced as a company. We know what we need to do to change the trajectory of this business, and our teams are focused on accelerating the pace of that change. Considering these factors, we expect full-year net sales growth of 1% to 3% and diluted net earnings per share of $1.70 to $1.82 per share. While we have work to do the rest of this fiscal year, we cannot lose sight of the progress we have made over the last two years. We are a significantly larger company today, 30% bigger, in fact. We are a more balanced company through the products we sell, and in the ways we reach our customers, consumers, and operators. We have transformed our company, not only through the Go Forward initiative, but with the investments we have continued to make in technology, capacity, and capabilities. 
And we have made all of this progress while simultaneously navigating a dynamic and volatile environment and managing through the impacts of HPAI. Our brands remain vibrant and relevant. Our strategies remain effective and our business is positioned for long-term growth. At this time, I will turn the call over to Jacim Smiley to discuss detailed financial information related to the first quarter and additional color on key drivers to our outlook. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, everyone. Net sales for the first quarter were $3 billion, a 2% decline to last year. Planned lower commodity pork and turkey volumes were the primary drivers of the decrease in net sales. We have now lapped our new pork supply agreement as of January and turkey supplies have improved since the fall. We anticipate more normalized volume comparisons for the remainder of the year, barring a return of HPAI in the spring. First quarter gross profit was $496 million compared to $539 million last year. Gross profit margin declined 100 basis points as the impact from pricing actions was more than offset by unfavorable mix and persistent inflationary pressures. For the first quarter, SG&A expenses as a percent of net sales increased marginally to 7.5%. The company continued to support its leading brands through advertising investments. Advertising expenses were $47 million during the quarter comparable to last year. Of note, we promoted black label bacon over the holiday season, and the planter's brand was once again front and center at this year's big game with the roast of Mr. Peanut. Equity and earnings of affiliates for the first quarter increased significantly compared to last year due to improved results for Megamex and our joint venture in the Philippines. Operating income for the first quarter was $289 million compared to $320 million last year. Operating margins compressed to 9.7% compared to 10.5% last year. Net unallocated expenses in the first quarter increased $7 million. This increase was driven by higher employee-related expenses and outside consulting fees. The effective tax rate for the quarter moved modestly higher to 22.6% compared to 22.4% last year. Last year's rate reflected higher stock option exercise benefits. The effective tax rate for fiscal 2023 is expected to be 21% to 23%. The net result of all these factors was diluted net earnings per share of 40 cents. Turning to cash flow, operating cash flow was $204 million for the first quarter compared to $384 million last year. This decline was driven by lower net earnings and an increase in working capital. As Jim mentioned, we purchased a 29% common stock interest in Garuda Food, a leading food and beverage company in Indonesia. We obtained a minority interest from various shareholders for a purchase price of $411 million, including associated transaction costs. The transaction was funded using cash on hand. We do not expect the transaction to have a material impact on our fiscal 2023 results. We are targeting $350 million in capital expenditures for 2023. In addition to the newly commissioned SPAM product line, we recently approved a $40 million expansion for our Columbus line of premium charcuterie products and additional capacity for higher demand planters items at the Fort Smith, Arkansas facility. We also continue to invest heavily in automation projects. 
as evidenced by a recently completed project supporting turkey processing at the Fairbolt, Minnesota facility. The project automates more than 30 difficult, highly repetitive jobs at the plant, further aiding our efforts to improve employee retention and satisfaction. We paid our 378th consecutive quarterly dividend effective February 15th at an annual rate of $1.10 per share, a 6% increase over last year. We ended the first quarter with $3.3 billion in debt, unchanged from the prior year. We remain committed to maintaining an investment grade rating. As Jim detailed, we have lowered our diluted net earnings per share outlook for the year and have action plans in place for the balance of fiscal 2023. In terms of cadence for the year, we expect diluted net earnings per share in the second quarter to be significantly lower than last year. We expect unfavorable mix in the retail segment short-term margin compression due to our immediate actions across the supply chain, and for continued COVID-related disruption in China to negatively affect the second quarter. We are also not expecting a repeat of last year's lower effective tax rate. As we look to the second half of the year, we expect earnings growth compared to last year, led by the food service and international segment, gradual improvement in the cost environment, and higher turkey volumes. We are beginning to see signs of market stabilization and even cost relief in certain areas such as raw materials and freight. As anticipated, prices on key protein inputs generally declined during the quarter compared to last year and the fourth quarter. The USDA composite cutout declined 19% compared to the fourth quarter and was 2% lower than last year. This decrease was driven primarily by bellies, which declined 26% compared to last year. Higher cost inventory was generally a headwind in the first quarter and will continue to affect results as we work to reduce inventories. We have assumed a benefit from lower raw materials costs in the back half of the year. Similarly, we saw a more balanced freight environment during the first quarter as demand for trucks moderated. We expect freight rates for the remainder of the year to be lower compared to last year. In addition to the actions we are taking to address inventory levels and inflation, our teams remain focus on identifying and capturing cost savings opportunities as supply chain conditions normalize. HPAI remains a significant risk facing the business. While the last reported case in our supply chain was early December, the virus continues to impact domestic poultry supplies. There is increased risk to our supply chain into the spring as migration begins along the Mississippi Flyway. Assuming current conditions hold, reduced production volume in our Turkey facilities is expected through the end of the second quarter before steadily improving in the back half of the year. This should be supportive of our Turkey business as demand for genuine Turkey products remains strong. Turkey markets have become less favorable as breast meat prices have steadily declined over the last month. Additionally, historically high feed costs remain a headwind for our business. Considering these factors, we expect improved meat availability in the back half of the year to drive higher sales volumes for our turkey business, offsetting the impact of market declines and higher feed costs. Additionally, we made significant progress towards fully integrating Genio Turkey store into the company's one supply chain and new operating segments during the first quarter. We remain on track to achieve 20 to $30 million of savings on a run rate basis by the end of the fiscal 2023. As noted, 
Last quarter, there were incremental investments planned against one supply chain and go forward. Our new business model demands this, and our strong financial position allows us to continue investing for the long term. In closing, I want to acknowledge the demanding work of all the teams across the organization to make the Go Forward initiative possible. I remain confident that once fully implemented, our new strategic operating model will better align the businesses to the needs of our customers, consumers, operators, and shareholders to deliver sustainable long-term growth. At this time, I'll turn the call over to the operator for the question and answer portion of the call. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. Should you have a question, please press star followed by the one on your touchtone phone. You will hear a three-tone prompt acknowledging your request. Should you wish to decline from the polling process, please press the star followed by the two. If you are on a speakerphone, please lift the hands up before pressing any keys. One moment, please, for your first question. The first question comes from Rupesh Parikh of Oppenheimer. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thanks for taking my question. So to start out for us, you know, the report today is not really consistent with what we typically see from Hormel. So what happened and what are the key efforts from here to improve performance? Um, good, good morning, Rupesh. Um, you know, we we agree with you. You know, the the word that that we used uh, is we're disappointed, and uh, these are not results that that we expected. Um, you know, but I do think it's it's important that even with that disappointment, to remember you know just how far we've come uh, with our supply chain and everything they've been through over the, the last three years. You know, we go back to obviously the COVID impact when plants were shut down and we didn't have labor. And then when we did have labor, it was turning over. And so we, we are in a more stable operating environment for, for sure. And so, you know, fill rates continue to improve. Uh, labor is better. And, you know, production capacity across key categories for us is good. Um, you know, but as we think about quarter one, you know, that, you know, in the context of our, this dynamic and volatile environment is a, a bit more explainable. Uh, you know, we talked about China. That's easy to understand. You know, food service had, you know, a period of softness, but, you know, their, their business continues to be strong and, and will stay strong for the balance of the year. We mentioned planters, which you know, we met our expectations last year, but are seeing a slower start this year, and we, we know what we need to get done there. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, avian influenza, still still battling that. So, you know, we've said since the fall we've been operating with elevated inventories. We wanted to get fill rates up. You know, we needed more inventory to support our expanded network. Um, you know, the, the big thing here is, probably a misalignment of our, our inventory and our demand because we expected the inventory to clear. Uh, it didn't and it hasn't. And it's resulted in inefficiencies across the supply chain and, and higher operating costs when we think about product in warehouses and probably moving it more uh, than we had expected. And so those are those are real dollars um, that that impacted us in the quarter. You know, and then you know the, the other thing is you know, we want to be careful when we when we talk about inventory, uh, because as we progress throughout the year, it's not going to be as simple as just looking at a dollar amount to to gauge how we're doing. You know, mix is huge in our in our portfolio when we think about pounds versus dollars, impacts of markets. You know, a potential rebound in Turkey. You know, times when we may be building inventory to support cu customer promotional activity. All those things are, are part of our, our inventory mix. And really for us, you know, we'll be talking uh, to all of you just like we're doing today in a very transparent manner to say, is our demand or is our inventory uh, aligned with our demand? And that's really going to be the key indicator going forward. So we're disappointed where we are, but we know what we uh, what we need to do 
and probably said it the most simple way possible is that after almost three years of chasing this unprecedented demand, supply caught demand, and we needed to react sooner, and, and we didn't. Yeah. And another important point um, to just mention here, Rapesh, is that, you know, as as we have this elevated inventory, what it does is also just delay us from recognizing and benefiting from some of the costs coming down. You know, we, when we think about, you know, freight rates, um, markets coming down, we haven't really been able to realize those, um, and that's been delayed. We talked about it in the fourth quarter that we should see that relief here and those benefits showing up in our margins this quarter, and that's been delayed as well and, and affecting where we're sitting right now from a guidance perspective. Great. Thank you for the color there. And then I'm going to slip in another question. So I think in your prepared comments, you mentioned something about learning about people. I think you said technology and processes. Um, what are the key learnings there? And then, you know, how quickly can they be implemented? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and start on that, Rupesh. I mean, I think there's a couple of things there that, that we need to talk about just to, you know, to level set, you know, those comments. I mean, the first thing is, you know, we're a much larger company today you know, than we were two years ago. And it's not just the, the planter's acquisition. That's part of it. You know, but we've seen significant growth in our in our business. Um, you know, we haven't stopped acting on our strategic priorities. You know, everything that we've talked about in terms of becoming more balanced, transforming our company, you know, we've continued to move that forward, you know, all while navigating this crazy current environment and managing through avian influenza. And so when, when we say that we've learned a lot about our people, you know, we have we've have the right people. You know, as we've gone through our Go Forward initiative, we just need to make sure that we have them doing the right work. And Go Forward will help with that. You know, when we talk about processes, as we've integrated a businesses, you know, there are processes that will need a refresh. You know, when we think about inventory, pricing decisions, brand resourcing, and, you know, go forward will, will help with that as well. And then I, you know, on the technology side, I'll, I'll maybe let Jacinth add some, some color there. Yeah. So, you know, from a, from a short term perspective, you know, we, we are uh, probably just a level set. I mean, this team knows how to manage inventory. And so what we're doing in the immediate term here is just returning to that pre-pandemic discipline when we think about SNOE and the process that is aligned with ensuring that we're listening to demand signal, connecting our commercial team with our supply chain team and getting all our supply planning aligned. Um, and so that's what we're doing in the immediate term. And then from a long-term perspective, we have made significant investment from a systems and technology standpoint with Project Orion. And we pause that intentionally as we were integrating planters, integrating JOT, um, and that was purposeful to get those done correctly. And now we're now continuing that work to enhance our SNOP and our end-to-end -end planning and be able to leverage our technology and our people to get us to the next level. Great. Thank you for all the color and best of luck. Thank you. The next question comes from Robert Mosco of Credit Suisse. Please go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm a little confused as to where the inventory is building up in terms of your portfolio and, you know, what categories did you um, uh, underestimate the, the volume weakness? Is it bellies? Is it protein? Is it in the freezers? Because you mentioned in your prepared remarks a lot of products that did really, really well, and you talked about strong demand. So, you know, what, what kind of demand were you expecting, and, and where did it fall short? Yeah, good morning, Rob. Um, you know, we did we did also say that we had across all segments some volume softness. So we, we certainly had a lot of brands and categories that, that did really well. You know, we, we talked about planters being off to a slower start, so that's a, a part of it. And we did also talk about that period of time with our food service business where we where we had softness, and so that too is is part of it. Um, you know, the food service piece will experience growth for the balance of the year. You know, less 
less concerned about that. But it's really, I mean, it's a little bit across the board on the, the sales and volume side. But then the other part to consider is what we're talking about with our supply chain is there's a level of overproduction as, as well. And so, you know, as we've, as we've, you know, gotten better in our supply chain and wanted to run it more productively, more efficiently, you know, they've been running hard and we've built that inventory. In some cases, that inventory is not aligned with the demand. And so that's really our issue is, is it's a little bit across the board on the product side, uh, or I'll say the sales side, and then, you know, across on the supply chain side, this overproduction, which, which built the inventory. Okay, because if I can dig in a little, Jim, like, like I think six to nine months ago, the issue was labor shortages, turnover, you know, couldn't run the plants effectively enough to meet demand, and now they're overproducing? Exactly. Yep, Rob, I mean, okay. that, that's exactly, and I, I said that a little while ago, you know, if we go back over the last three years, everything that we've been through and that those different scenarios of, you're right, not having people. And then when we were getting people, they were turning over. And now that we're getting people, we're keeping people, you know, the plants are running more productively and more efficiently, um, you know, at that, and our goal is to make sure that we're getting up to fill rates and that, you know, we do have some production capacity. So our, our plants have, have gotten better. And like I said, in some cases, they've, they've outproduced demand. And that is definitely part of the problem. Okay. Uh, last question on planters. Um, you know, when I look at the Nielsen tracking data, the unit sales are certainly down. The volumes are down over the last 12 weeks, like 6 or 7%. But that's been consistent for the past 52 weeks. You know, unit sales have been down by that amount. Were you expecting a big pickup in unit sales and, and, and total sales in the quarter on stronger marketing and Super Bowl marketing, and, and it just didn't play out? Yeah, I think a couple of things there, Robin, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Deanna. You know, as we think about, about planters, you know, in, in the short term, you know, it is about execution, driving demand, and also, also the mix. Um, you know, we've said this multiple times and it just bears restating is that we did deliver on our, our year one commitments. You know, we've maintained some stable distribution. You know, and we, you know, we've seen some channel shifting with the business as well. Uh, but it, the demand is certainly lower versus our expectations in, in Q1. And so as we're thinking about this business now, it's, it's really, you know, what are we going to do in the short term from an execution perspective? And Deanna, I'll let you add some color there. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thanks, Rob. You know, just as we think about it, we, we knew this business was where it was when we acquired it. And again, we were interested in this business from, from the snacking perspective and, and really is a long-term ambition for us. So when we think about um, plant-based protein, entertaining snacking, and our ambitions for C-Store, those still remain front and center. Um, in the short term, we do have execution challenges, in particular our base business, which is a top priority for the team. When I also look to Q1, that was when we cut over the inventory from the prior owner. So there is some noise there and some things that happened in, in the quarter, as well as we inherited some distribution losses right out of the gate that the team has been working against. And as we head into Q2, we'll recover some of those important distribution uh, points that will really help stabilize the base business. Um, we're really energized by the innovation. I was with our, our planters R&D and marketing team um, earlier this week and in, in the pipeline of innovation that this team has in front of us for both uh, the rest of 23, 24 and beyond is, is exceptional and really um, energizing in regards to where they see this business going. Um, when we, we talk about innovation, you'll also see innovation launch in this quarter, both in the core business as well as in our C-Store business. You mentioned Super Bowl. We did have a, a really um, fun Super Bowl ad that was really centered on on peanuts because we, we do know that the consumers are thinking about the mix of, of, of nuts and snacking right now. 
and peanuts are a really uh, valuable item for them, so reminding them of, of how much fun planters' peanuts can be, as well as the protein they deliver and a great snacking option. Um, we'll see that. It wasn't just a 30-second 30, a 30 commercial. You'll see activation both before the event, after the event, and really leads us into um, the quarter as we activate some of the other seasonal launches later in the year. Um, the other thing to think about is not only that this business was, was starved, and we've been investing both from an advertising perspective, from an innovation standpoint, as I mentioned, and, and then also um, <clears throat> from a capacity standpoint. So for us to grow this business, we need to add capacity, which we've invested in, in regards to tube nuts for, for the Sea Store channel, as well as the club channel. And we'll, we'll see that come online here later this year and into next. Um, we also have work to do with the, the portfolio. Frankly, the assortment and price pack architecture, it, it's a big portfolio, and we know there's optimization that will allow us to unlock growth. And um, really, again, just thinking about where we're at with this business. You know, we acquired the business last year. We integrated the business, and right now we're executing the business, and we know we've got work to do, but really confident in what I saw this week with the teams and, and the, where we're headed into Q2 and the rest of the year. Thank you. The next question comes from Eric Larson, Seaport Research Partners. Please go ahead. Thank you, everyone. Um, so just a couple of questions. Can you uh, provide a little bit more detail again uh, or just remind us kind of the cadence of turkey volumes. I think turkey volumes on a year-over-year -year basis still have a difficult comp in Q2, and then I believe you were expecting those to start rebounding in, in the second half. And then um, also do the same thing for us with your commodity pork volumes. Um, you should be starting to anniversary, I think, when you offloaded with a, with a new contract some of that commodity volume when do we sort of anniversary sort of the, uh, you know, the adverse comps that you would have on your on your uh, commodity pork? Yep. <clears throat> Good morning, Eric. Um, so on the, on the turkey side, you know, the numbers that we've been talking about have have come through that, you know, turkey's been down high 20s, 30% in terms of, of volume. And we expect that through the, the first half or now the second quarter of this year and expect volumes to rebound in the back half of the year. And that's all with the assumption that we don't have another significant AI outbreak like we did last year. And then, of course, uh, you know, some events into the, the winter months. On the pork side, you know, we are now just lapping that supply agreement. And so as we go throughout the balance of the year, uh, the, the comps will be, will be more normalized. Okay, thanks. And then, and then just, um, you know, just a quick follow up. Um, and this is maybe, you know, for, for, uh, Diana. Um, can you give us a little bit? You, you mentioned elasticities, uh, and where you were seeing some of the maybe more elasticity in some of your retail products. Can you give us a little bit more color on, on where those are and uh, whether you may have to have some promotional adjustments on that. That was mentioned, I believe, in some of the prepared comments. Yeah, so it's very interesting because it's a bit bipolar in that you've got some categories uh, where the elasticities are playing out exactly as expected. We've got other categories where the consumer has acknowledged the, the change in price on shelf and continues to, to purchase in their regular cycles. Um, I would say where we're seeing more elasticity would be in areas that could be higher uh, rings. So thinking of like a fully cooked rack of ribs, we've seen some some demand declines there. Um, obviously having other areas for the consumer to shift to. So take a tub of barbecue or um, a dinner entree that has a lower price ring but still allows allows or meets the same consumer need of putting dinner on the table. So making sure that, as you mentioned, that we're promoting our products and pulsing in some of those areas um, and that we're advertising and making sure our consumers understand the value of our products and how they can utilize them um, speaks to the breadth of our portfolio. You know, we've always talked about why it's valuable to have products at different price points and that meet different consumer need states. 
um, and, and it's exceedingly important right now. Thank you. The next question comes from Ben Thayer of Berkeley's. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, interesting on the last name. Um, th thanks for thanks for taking my question. Um, just uh, one I had on the on the different um, demand drivers, retail versus food service in particular, um, because if we if we look into it, they're both somewhat equally down in sales, but then at the same time, and, and food service, we were actually able to expand margins when retail we we saw the margin contraction. So if we come back to the whole inventory and the misalignment and um, demand kind of exceeding, well, supply kind of exceeding demand, um, is that particularly in retail where you got these these issues and this misalignment which caused the margins to be under pressure? Um, or is that also something you saw in food service just not at the same magnitude, maybe because of mix what falls into food service? Thank you. Yeah, Ben, I think that the way you described it there at the end of your question uh, is is correct. I mean, there are inventory issues in both, but but retail is is currently more. You know, as you talked about, you know, the the food service uh, pricing and sales. You know, the the element of that is, and we we've, we've talked about this frequently, is we have seen some commodity relief, and on the food service side of the business they're able to price closer to the market. The, the pricing is, is a lot more fluid. Okay, and then my follow-up just quickly on China. I mean, we all know fourth quarter, particularly December, was was a very tough one with the whole reopening and cases, et cetera. But as of today, um, early March, um, have you seen, like, particularly in February and, and, like, signs of consumers being in a more normal uh, environment of consumption? So is it fair to assume that that could be an easier fix um, go forward than maybe some of the issues you have um, on the inventory side over in North America? Yeah, again, Ben, that's, that's a very fair assessment. And, you know, we, we said that, that, you know, we have seen uh, early in the second quarter the, the China food service business has seen a, a nice uptick or nice rebound as, you know, consumer or, uh, you know, Chinese population seems to be making their way through COVID and are now heading back out. So we've, we've seen food service up, you know, on the retail side of the business. Uh, we're really excited about the continued innovation that we've been able to deliver. Um, the other thing you know, when we built that plant several years ago, uh, you know, we put in a, a spam line, and our spam business has done really well, especially our spam singles business. And so we've seen that continue to grow on the retail side to the point where we'll be making some uh, additional investments to support that growth. But your your take on China is exactly what we're seeing and how we're thinking about it. Thank you. The next question comes from Tom Palmer of J.P. Morgan. Please go ahead. Good morning, and thank you for the question. Um, I'm sorry to belabor the inventory discussion. I just want to clarify something a bit. Um, so it sounded like in the prepared remarks there were some constraints in terms of sourcing pork and turkey right now um, and that you're unable to produce enough peanut butter. So maybe, maybe I heard this wrong, but – I don't think planners can account for a lot of the inventory issue. So I, I just hope to better understand what types of products you've built up too much inventory of, and is it certain pork products um, that, that fall into that equation? Yeah, so, Tom, I'll start with that, that first question. So we, we didn't have any difficulty sourcing uh, pork products for, you know, production. What we've said is it's just the decline is what we would have normally had coming at us that we don't today. So we used to have to sell it. Today we don't. That's that's what we're talking about for the pork decline. The turkey is absolutely, you know, not enough not enough turkey coming through to support the business. Um, but as we think about, you know, the, the inventory across the entire portfolio, you're right. I mean, it's not all planters. I mean, that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, when we think about 
you know, as I described earlier, some of it is inventory that has been built for promotion. So think spam as we get into bigger promotions throughout the year. Uh, we do have elevated inventories of ribs. We have some elevated inventories of complete bacon bits. So it is a mixed bag, other perishable refrigerated items. So it's a mixed bag across the inventory that we have and the portfolio. And so, yeah, we're not trying to pin this on any one item or one category. I mean, it, it is broad-based. Okay, thank you, and thanks for all the details. Um, and maybe just follow up on, on the price increases you mentioned at retail. Just just any detail on how much of the portfolio is being addressed with pricing, any, any help on the magnitude, the timing, and then just um, – you know, are there certain commodity types that need to be addressed in particular? Yeah, Tom, thanks. This is Deanne. I'll jump in there. So we still have wraparound pricing that's flowing through. We took several price increases last year, and some of those are still flowing through. Uh, we have a chunk of the portfolio that is in, currently in price increases, roughly about 5%. Um, you know, we've taken very mind, a very mindful approach to our, our pricing in thinking about, you know, elasticities, volumes, where we've added capacity. Obviously, we want to make sure that we were, were able to leverage that capacity. And so we've tried to be very mindful. So we've taken multiple price increases, probably in smaller increments than some of our competitors have announced. Um, and really, the increases we're taking are, are justified uh, for inflation. And so and we'll continue to monitor that. We've got the ones, as I mentioned, that are already in, in the quarter um, happening, and we've got a few other categories that we're evaluating as we sit today. Thank you. The next question comes from Peter Gulbo of Bank of America. Please go ahead. Hey, guys. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for taking the question. Um, maybe just the first question, more of a technical question around the resegmentation. Um, just in just to level set everybody on the call, have you disclosed at all just what percentage of the new retail business will be captured in, in scanner data, so in Nielsen and IRI? And I think you had a helpful breakout um, for retail, particularly just on the different, you know, the different verticals. Is there anything you can do to help us on the food service side? I don't think there was anything in, in the slide deck from Tuesday. So in terms of the um the the retail component it, it'll be somewhere around um you know 80 80% um and then you know on the food service side I mean there wouldn't be anything that you would you would actually see. Yeah, we're right, um, no, but just, sorry, go ahead. No, that's okay, Peter. You know, we're not going to have the same kind of vertical structure, you know, within within food service um just because it it doesn't I mean, industry doesn't even really think about it that way. What we will try to do over time is provide you, you know, more color. So, so for example, um, you know, in this quarter, as we integrated the JOTS business, and we've talked about how that is going to be a benefit to both, you know, the, the JOTS business and the Hormel business, you know, a, a channel like K through 12, our school business, had a really good quarter. Um, so we'll continue to try to provide that type of color, but from a, I'll say, a typical reporting, it will all roll up just into food service. Okay. Th thanks for that, Jim. And then, uh, yep. again, just to go back to, to the inventory side and, and maybe just to, to think about it in a little bit of a different manner, if you are going to be selling through, you know, more of your inventory or trying to get it more more right sized, I guess why wasn't there an adjustment to to the sales line as well? Just thinking about if you're going to sell into, I don't know, more discount channels or, or, or whatever you're going to have to do. And, and then the second part of that question is just in your conversations with retailers, how should we think about, you know, what they're asking you to do? Is it to carry more of the burden of working capital? Um, carry, you know more inventory for them because they want to have less in, in terms of their working capital needs and just the implications is how you're thinking about it on cash flow. So I know that's a lot kind of as a two-part question, but appreciate the thought. Yeah, no, it, it's really, really good question. And so, no, we have not moved off of our, our top line guidance. Um, you know, we know that there's a uh, turkey uncertainty 
you know, and, and expect that to come back in the back half of the year. You know, the other part of this is our, our food service business. And so even though we, you know, had some softness for a period of time in the first quarter, we expect growth for the, for the balance of the year. So those really are two drivers. And then, you know, as we expect our international business to, to come back with some of those challenges abating, you know, we, we do believe that we'll be able to, to deliver that top line. And then, you know, the second part of that question, you know, we're not, we're not getting that, that pressure from, from retailers in terms of keep more inventory. You know, as, as just said earlier, you know, we know how to run this business. And, you know, historically we've had very, very strong fill rates. It's obviously some of the supply chain challenges that we've had over the last two or three years that have prevented us from getting to those fill rates. But slowly but surely, we are getting those fill rates back to where they were. And so when we we're able to operate the way that we did pre-pandemic, that's really the, the expectation. Thank you. The next question comes from Michael Lavery of Piper Sandler. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I, I, I just want to come back to planters specifically. It's when you detail some of these challenges, it's, it's one of the three things you call out as a focus area uh, in terms of optimizing promotional support and, and everything else. But then you also called out the capacity expansion, uh, even though those volumes have been down kind of mid or more single digits for, for some time. Can you maybe Elaborate on what pain points the, the capacity expansion solves, given the current situation. Sure. Thanks, Michael. The, the capacity expansion specifically addressed the continued evolution of snacking, as well as sea store and club club channel. So the the cap capacity we're adding is specific packaging that really is on trend with how consumers want to snack today. When you think about the tube nut in particular both in a singular purchase as well as in a club variety. The additional capacity is really designed to help us continue to meet the, the demand, <clears throat> which is um, exceptional there. And then the other area of growth that we haven't talked about that is really a hidden gem in the portfolio is the corn nut business and some really great flavors that are coming to market. And as we think of the convenience store business, really the 100 days of summer is where that, that – business really comes to light. So adding capacity both for C store and club store is, is where we're leaning into right now. And I think it's important to know, Michael, these these are things that we knew when we when we bought the business. Right? We knew that there was gonna have to be some packaging innovation, which we did last year with the, the new bottle, and then also um, you know, some capacity investment. So it was existing packaging but we saw that as, as an opportunity. It was just a matter of what the timing was that we were going to need it. And then as, as Deanna mentioned, you know, we've seen really, really strong growth since day one for the corn nuts business, and, and we don't expect that to, to slow down. Okay, that, that's helpful. And just coming back to Garuda, um, did you have an option for – a bigger stake there, or, or or could you at some point? How do we think about whether or not that ever becomes part of, uh, uh, um, you know, above the line in operations? Yeah, I think, you know, for now it was, you know, we we took out the um, the, the previous private equity owner. That was the the big stake that was for sale. Um, you know, so for us it was the right size at the right time. Uh, you know, and again, I mean, we've been a partner with them, but it's early days and we still, we still need to, to learn about the business, about the market. We know it supports our two strategic initiatives for adding scale and stacking and entertaining and developing that global presence. And so as we go along, we certainly think there will be opportunities for us to, you know, if the business delivers for us to take a bigger position. Thank you. Our last question comes from Adam Samuelson of Goldman Sachs. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, thanks uh, for squeezing me in. Um, so I guess first question just on, on Genio, um, or Turkey, I should say. Um, 
you talking about volumes improving and starting to normalize in the back half, assuming uh, no further uh, HPAI, but I think in Europe you start to see this commodity pricing pricing cu coming down, and that would continue if there is no further supply disruptions in the Turkey market. Commodity pricing pricing was actually a big margin uplift to, the, to that business last year. Um, I know it's now getting it's now split between retail and, and food service and international, so it's not as visible. But did your full year outlook for your Turkey business profitability actually come down with this update? I just it's not clear because um, it would seem like Turkey breast meat pricing is a pretty big become, could be a pretty big headwind over the balance of the year. Yeah, Adam. Uh, good morning. You know, we we have not changed the the outlook for the turkey business uh, at all. You know, you're right that we've seen you know lower breast meat markets, but the the turkey business is still in a, a very favorable position. You know, turkey demand is strong. Uh, you know, the value added portion of the business uh, continues to do well, and you know, as we get more meat, we'll be able to fill more of that. Um, you know, we know that whole birds cleared really well uh, this holiday season, and that bodes well as we head into the, the next holiday season. And then I, I do think, it, you know, for, for us, this is all about what happens with, with AI. And we'll know a lot more here in the next couple of months as to, you know, what, if any, impact it will have in the business. But, yeah, we, we've not changed our outlook and feel like there's still plenty of opportunities to, to drive a strong performance, even as the breast meat market has gone lower. Okay. And then if I could just ask one last follow-up, and this inventory question has come up in a lot of different ways, but I guess I'm struck with the new seg reporting structure and the new segment structure kind of there's a little bit less kind of connectivity between some of the plants and the, and the end sales channels than there might have been before. Um, there's always some disparity. Uh, but you now have like bacon going through two different channels versus one previously or two reporting units. And how are you thinking about kind of the ownership on working capital and kind of tying performance of, of business leaders to um, not just segment profit or sales, but also whether it's a cash flow or turn on net asset kind of metric that I don't think had been a big criteria, big part of the incentive compensation structure previously. Yeah. So Adam, I mean, the, the you know, the flow of the product through the, the sales side really hasn't changed, you know, and, you know, we've had it, you know, the bacon example you mentioned, you know, we've had it going into retail and we've had it going into food service the, the same way that, that we always have. You know, if anything, this structure actually centralizes and creates less confusion in terms of who has responsibility with, you know, Deanna now overseeing retail. And it's, it's really, really helpful. Um, you know, we do have elements of our incentive that are, you know, that do take into account return on invested capital. You know, we use that more as a, a modifier to make sure that the team continues to keep an eye on that because we know how, how important it is. Uh, but we're not, we don't have any plans to, to change the, the rate of that as an element of, of compensation. We feel like we've got the pro proper oversight to drive improvement over time. Yeah, and and just for just to clarify or or just to emphasize, you know, go for the go forward structure hasn't in any way um, muddied up the waters in terms of the you know how how we look at the business and how incentives are aligned to drive the results, it actually does the complete opposite. And now there is very clear delineation and transparency in terms of objectives and driving the results and the outcome for the business. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude your conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.